Our guest for the artist talk tonight is Nareet Avasar. Is that the right way to say your name? Exactly. Very, very right. <laughs> and she's a terrific artist, a longtime member of SCWCA, and has both a wonderful way of making her art, her process <laughs> that you'll share of her personal journey and the resultant artwork. And she both creates art and she has done a good deal of curating and uh, in many, many ways collaborates with people and place and the environment. And I think we're gonna be delighted. So um, turn it to you. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining and thank you for coming to hear my story. Um, my name is Noreen Avisar. I'll start with a little bit of with a short story about my life introduction, which, which kind of explains the way I do my art. I was born in Israel in a small kibbutz that was located next to the border with uh, Jordan, the state of Jordan. And uh, that was a while ago. Uh, Israel was a very young and developing country. And life was very full of challenges and worries for the adults, for the grown up in our community. It was a very small community, a little bit isolated. And uh, most all the adults experienced war and loss of loved ones. And a lot of them were survivors of programs in East Europe and the Holocaust. So they did their best to provide us, the children, with um, happy and uh, they didn't want to share their horrors with us. And they did pretty, and they did a good job. We had, uh, I definitely had a very happy childhood, but um, I always sensed the sadness, the, it was a somber place. I always sensed that there were things, it just uh, very hard to explain, but we know that there's a lot of things that uh, are unsaid. Uh, I, I felt very sorry for, for you know, my, my parents, my grandparents. Uh, when I was seven, I moved, my family moved to the city of Jerusalem. And uh, I always was into drawing and painting. We didn't really have a lot of uh, paints or, I mean, it was a very, uh, life were very basic. Uh, because I didn't know how to write, I guess, I always invented stories and, um, between first and third grade, I sat at the back of the class and illustrated those stories and shared it with the kids that were sitting next to me and my friends. Um, the teacher was actually very sympathetic. When I was third grade, she told my parents in a very serious way that I'm going to be an artist. And they, I guess she meant for them to support me. I'm not sure how they took it, but uh, being an artist as a profession or a lifestyle was really not anything that people thought about those days. Life was very, very simple. It was simple and very basic, but there were a lot of, it, it was very rich with culture. Not very many cultural institutions, but a lot of the people, Israel was full of refugees. A lot of the people that came from different parts of the world, there were a lot of artists, visual artists, musicians, um, theater, my best friend's uh, father was actually one of those uh, very accomplished artists. His name is uh, Joseph uh, Hirsch. And um, I used, he was, there was only one good art school in Israel, one, one art school really. And he was an instructor there. I used to watch in the tiny little apartment, in the tiny little studio, how he created his work. And I was fascinated. It was a magic for me. And I also, internalize the fact that you could actually choose art as, as a serious career, as a life lifestyle and, and occupation. When I, I moved to, I immigrated to United States, to Los Angeles when I was 22, and I enrolled in a small art school it called Hollywood Art Center, not the big one in Pasadena. It is uh, on, was located on Highland Avenue in Hollywood. The, the property was, uh, was owned by a family. It was a family-run business. It's now, uh, I believe it's a historical uh, location right now. Mona Levinson was the uh, instructor that ran it. The place really trained you. It's kind of interesting, and I think I'm very lucky that I was able to experience those days. It trained you to be a commercial artist, but mostly for the movie studios and for Disney. So those days we learned a lot of 
fine art skills. My major was illustration. It was a very good practical uh, education. I left after three years, uh, not completing my degree because we really needed to work and I needed uh, to make money. I worked as a commercial artist and uh, actually had a lot of fun, a lot of uh, fine art skills. Really, I really uh, mastered them during those period. When my second son was born, um, I quit working. We, uh, we, I moved, we actually moved from the city to uh, Agua Hills and I raised my family. I was always interested in art and find art. I would seek uh, art history books. I, I read a lot about all sort of artists and techniques, but uh, choosing art as my main occupation was just not an option uh, with a very active family. Eventually I started taking classes at um, local place. When my kids were growing up at, at local place, my instructor name was uh, Bobby Mullen Kramer. She, she's a lifelong friend and a mentor. And she really introduced me to the idea that unlike commercial art, art could be intellectual and critical to develop my critical skills. And I, I was fascinated with that. I started taking classes at Pierce College and planned to go into eventually to, uh, to take art in school. 1999, my oldest son, um, got in a very bad car accident. And I took about a couple years uh, concentrating on his recovery. About three years after the accident, I figured out that um, if I don't go to school now, I will never do it and I will really regret it. I enrolled to CSUN in CSUN for our studio art. I uh, got my BA degree and my MA degree. My professor was Samantha Field. And uh, I took classes with wonderful professors, Betty Brown, Karen Schiffman, uh, Kim Eblis, and others. And those were really, it was a wonderful time of growth and uh, intellectual growth, artistic growth. I'm definitely so glad that I've done that. So um, I will start explaining about my art and um, maybe I'll read a little part of segment of my not a long one of my art statement. Because the way I grew up and the way I was raised, I the idea that uh, history is always personal is very essential for my work. And uh, I'm a little bit a restless artist. I change a lot of styles and um, techniques, but this idea has been very basic for, for, my, for my art making. In the, during the last 10 years or so, I've been concentrating on type of art that is really based on the process. I'll explain, I think my art statement explains it the best. So it says, um, my mixed media pieces are combinations of many layers, blended and merged through labor intensive, creative and destructive process. They sometimes incorporate material like window screen, rust and tar into the language of paint. The process of what revealed and destroyed paralleled the way that history is interwoven with the present and the future. I've always been fascinated by the effect of history on the present and the way current event will determine the future. And the last uh, line is most is really is how we determine and what legacy will leave for future generation with um, climate change and uh, global warming. So, um, I'll start with the process that I'm doing, and then um, I'll go farther than that. All right, so uh, I start with a large piece of paper, and then I paint freely on it, just with acrylic. Then I cover it with another piece of paper. This is all done uh, with acrylic-based paints. Sometimes there are, there are moments in those paintings that I really feel very sad to cover, but uh, it's part of the process, a part of the idea. I have to just um, destroy them. I use a lot of different materials. I'm kind of, my studio is a mess always. And uh, papers, acrylic pieces, twines, uh, rust, or pieces of wood, leaves. Um, then I sand between the, the two layers, I sand. And the reason why I have two photos here because sanding takes a long time. It's a very labor intensive until uh, 
Some of the images have been revealed and some are not. This is a example of uh, one piece called Icarus. Uh, it took me nine months to complete it. I finished it, didn't like it, hung it even in a show, took it back to the studio, added more layers. And uh, sometimes I just um, cut between the layers to, uh, to earlier layers. Um, my work is very labor intensive. There are a lot of pieces of papers and I change my mind often and kind of like in process. This is the image Icarus. It is 72 by 50. And um, this piece called uh, Fallout and it's um, 65 by 49, almost 50. And this is the way it started after I sent it the paper. Usually I have those paper hanging in my studio for a long time. And I look at them and kind of discover paths in them. And it, it's, it becomes very relevant to the experiences that I, that I feel at the moment. And then I paint them. This was during the pandemic and the George Floyd murder and the riots. And the large dot in the center reminded me of a screaming mouth. And um, that's kind of like, it took, it's, a, it's kind of aggressive piece. This is in progress. On the left, the right is called In Changing Ground. It was a piece that I created for a solo show called In Your World. It was about uh, climate change. It was 2019. I was very affected by the Woosley fire, the Paradise fire that happened in 2018. And um, the piece on the left is set on my on my wall for a long time. The, the size of it is of uh, 50, uh, 46, I forgot, by, by 56, by 42, I believe. And um, when the fire happened, it just all the time clicked for me what it's going to be. My recent piece, the one I've completed a couple of weeks ago, it's called Paradise. Um, this is a good photo to kind of uh, explain the size. And uh, I do work very large and use electric sander, but when the detail come, when the end, I, I do pencil or very tight details. And this is what it looks like kind of in the beginning when I just had, um, right before I start working on it. So a little bit of history. I started as a figurative uh, narrative painter. And uh, this is a small piece. I did uh, that. And this is 2000, I think, in seven. This was 2011. So I come and sometimes I, I I haven't done figurative for a long time, but sometimes I go back to it. And uh, this is called Farewell. It's 56 by 46. Uh, there was a time when I still did the, the transition for me from figurative. I did figurative for many, many years. I did a series of, uh, created a series of uh, images of women the, in the uh, an object that they grabbed with them when they escaped time of wars or disaster and when they left what they had with them. This was the first of this uh, series, it's called Silver Bird. I was visiting family in Israel and uh, my husband's cousin told me, I saw a gorgeous dish, a silver dish that looks antique and she told me that um, her mother grabbed it when she escaped Iraq, right short time before she moved to Israel. And uh, I was fascinated with it. So I took a photograph, created a block print. And the picture here is, is not that woman, it's actually my niece. And uh, just because I didn't have a good photograph of the mother, but I think it doesn't have to be a specific woman. Uh, this piece and another piece I did of uh, a woman named Beatrice Cortez. Maybe some of you know her. She's a uh, I met her at King Ebley's class. She was a professor at CISN at the time and was taking art classes. She actually became a very accomplished artist. Uh, she told me when she was a young, very young woman or maybe teenager, she escaped El Salvador. She had a very short notice, she had very, very short notice. And she grabbed with her, her shell collections and she brought them and they were beautiful. And, um, 
I, I created a block print of the shells and two paintings. This one is for the war, the red one, and the blue one represents the ocean that she left. She must have really loved it. This is about on words. It's 20 by 20, I think, 20 by 20. It's a, a, it's a block print and actually a, a, a print of a, a stamp of a, of a wood that I created um, for the rings. It's this woman left and she took her wisdom with her in her life experience. This is monoprints, rust, uh, pencil and ink and oil. It's migration. Um, it's, sorry, just about the process of immigrating. And this is where it left behind once emptiness was not a fun time for me. It was very hard. And um, it's it's what you, you know, whoever is left behind after my kids left, not for disaster, but that's it. Eventually, I dropped the figure and I started just, uh, this was a series that I created mostly about water. I've, I've always been fascinated with water. Now we think about water, it's an environmental issue, but at the time it was for me as um, the cyclicity of water, the history of it, the cleansing, the forgiveness. It's just a very spiritual element and um, it goes beyond time, beyond geography. I was always been fascinated looking at rivers or water or ocean and wonder where those water been and what they've seen. So I had a, a, a photo of, uh, of the ocean. I blew it very large and created. There were nine pieces and monoprints of the same image, but each one was different color and a little different treatment. And I created a series of painting with it. And this one is 50 by 50 and it calls Night Flow. This was a sister one of it and it's called Below the Surface. It's it's based on the same image, but a different treatment. This one was also, uh, it's not, I think it was 50 by 60 or something. And it called, um, or maybe less, I forgot. It called, uh, I put an ocean between us. And um, that's more about my life, my life experience as an immigrant. This one is far away and long ago. I covered the image, it's, it's large, it's 50, it's, uh, 48 by 44 by 58 and I covered the whole uh, print the whole image with um, cheesecloth that I treated with uh, met medium so it kind of had a translucent it has a translucent feel to it with the water it really is uh, it's hard to photograph it but uh, the painting is really one of my favorite this one called deep blue it's 58 by 48 or 49 uh, this is more recent about water. It says, walk with me. I did it 2000, beginning of 2023 or, or the end of 2022. Um, I also did, a, a, I didn't mean to, but it got, I just, when I look at it, a lot of my work, it looked a little bit like landscape. So a lot of series of land. Um, and this one is called passing through. It's a small, not all my pieces are large. I do usually large pieces or 12 by 12. And uh, it's just very convenient for me to do 12 by 12, but I'm trying to break it into some sort of in between. So this calls uh, passing through. This is about location. It's called green wall and it's 38 by uh, 43, uh, 43 by 38. This is Vista. It's uh, 12 by 12. This was also done, this was, a, I think I would say 68 by 50 or by 46. Um, it's called Pending 2040. And uh, it is part of my solo show that was about climate change. And um, it's, it's about Pending 2040 is where uh, scientists at the time said, 2019, I think, or 2018, they said that the uh, uh, when uh, the temperature will rise above 1.5 Celsius degree and uh, life will change completely, there will be, a, it will be a point of no return. 
this showed in your world was uh, I was very touched by the was the fires in California, Paradise, and the Wolseley Fire. And um, I lived in Agoura Hills for about thirty years. We just moved to LA, but the fire that happened there really shook me to the core. My niece came um, three o'clock in the morning with her kids and dog and bird. My uh, nephew, her husband, was out of town. And it was very scary to think of your home burning. I, I mean, up until now, we, we just accept it. But at that time, it was, it, it really affected me very badly. So this is one piece from that show. Uh, again, Changing Ground is another piece of, uh, we've seen it before. Uh, adaptation. Adaptation is, I think, uh, it's not that large. It's 39 by 46. It's again another piece. It's about warming and cooling. It's a, an, another piece from that show uh, in your world. This is for Sun. It was not done for the show, but it is about a specific location and uh, a personal story about four Suns. This was also done for um, in your world, and it is a uh, monoprint and piece of rust. I, I put uh, rice paper, I treat it with uh, vinegar and I put it on a piece, a sheet of metal and wait for it outside in the environment for the rust, for it to absorb the rust. And then I used it in a lot of my work. And this is one of them. It's untitled and uh, it is about climate change. This one is Cradle. It's an older piece. It's monoprint uh, collage and painting a little oil on the roots in below. Gaia is again an uh, environmental piece. Truck was also environmental, uh, but then kind of landscape environmental. Uh, after the election of 2016, my work became for a while more political. This, uh, this piece called First Response uh, was early 2017. And I curated a show, group show at the uh, Keystone Art Space with, uh, I think the show was very successful with um, everybody, uh, just the election really moved a lot of people. And um, I had two small pieces at that show. This is one of them. And this is reproduction rights. And uh, it was during the time of the pussy heads, riots, women, not riots, I'm sorry, uh, women demonstrations. Uh, we were we thought that reproduction rights might be threatened and we definitely were right. So this is where the children, it is about the migrant children that were taken away and separate from the family and no one knew where they are, just like this void and the poor parents. I mean, I don't know what the end of the story. Um, I was very shaken by by those events. This is migration thrust. Again, it is a 12 by 12, it's mixed media. The idea of it is you really um, abusing people, separate the family will never stop migration. People move for safety and economic opportunities. 2019, uh, Susan Curlin and myself um, created an uh, installation, a shoebox project run by Christine Shoemaker. And this was, um, it was a lot of fun and uh, it was a complicated idea, but I think we did a pretty good job. We, we created a maze, not a very large one because the space is fairly small, which we hung a window screen that we painted blue and cheesecloth that we printed with um, the, uh, dark brown and orange sort of present major environmental concern. And then we took eggshells and we emptied the eggs and we put a uh, hundred fake hundred dollar bill inside of it and hung the eggs. Uh, they were hung very fragilely and people were, were invited to walk within there. Each one, uh, had, each egg had a reference for a cause, environmental cause, um, either mass extinction, lack of biodiversity, uh, rising sea level and droughts, collapse of democracy, whatever. And um, 
as it turned out, and I acted exactly the same, each and every one reached out for the money and the eggs will fall and break. And uh, eggs represent life and vulnerability. And uh, we name it all the king's men for the story of hum Humpty Dumpty. And um, there were a few other elements in that exhibit, but uh, there were a lot of discussions about it. And a lot of people came actually not knowing at all what it's about and expecting a social event. And I could see the wheels turning in a lot of people's mind. Um, this is another photo of it from below, kind of, and uh, another photo of it. And the walls were kind of gave you the impression of fires or drought, or they were kind of reference to fires. And during the pandemic times, um, my work became smaller, very detailed, very carefully rendered, and um, surreal, surrealistic, not surreal, surrealistic. This one is named, it's 12 by 12, and it's called uh, Strange Bug. This is Partners, and uh, this is a Phantom. This one is Farewell. Uh, push and pull, wild canaries. This one is, I, I've done it last year. Um, it's called Falling of the Edge. It is a much larger piece. It's a 44 by 44, but it's uh, kind of, I still paint in, in a way from the pandemic day. And this a detail of it, just show the um, the texture of it. This is the... I've, I created it for a show that uh, it's called um, Places We Carry. It's 36, uh, 46 by 38. And I think um, I created it for a show that I had last year at Studio China Island called Disconnection, which is about um, uh, multi-generational traumas and displacement. And I think it, it represents a lot of my work because it has... Um, it has a figure, it has a, a young person looking forward and carrying his place that not sure if it, it was there or it was just a part of a story that the person heard. On the left hand, there's another figure that could be either a broken wing or an older person that sort of lean on it. That's my interpretation of it. And um, this conclude my uh, my presentation. So. Let me stop sharing. And if there's any questions, we'd like to answer. I have a question. Oh. <laughs> so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about your decision to do the sanding, because I've known a few artists that do this process, and I know how labor intensive it is. And you're obviously an excellent painter, but you've made the decision to do this labor and smooth it out and lose things and find things. But um, kind of how did that decision come about? Um, you know what? I um, It's a very interesting question. I uh, Oh, okay. I had, the, I had the availability of a really wonderful press and press room. Uh, that I created all those pieces about the water that I showed you, the one, the nine pieces, the large piece, and I worked at it for a long time. And then I lost uh, access to that printing room, printing press, and tried a little bit, but it's very, uh, looking for presses is really, is, is kind of, it wasn't available. So I I just decided to paint and sort of create a surface, the, the the first layer surface, but it was too bright. So I started sanding it. And then I, I don't know why I, I covered it and sanding it looked so gorgeous because I can tear back and I can, I don't know, it would just work better. And then that's how I started. And then I, um, I, I started working with a person named Yoram Gill that um, just always, said, why don't you try something big? And then I sent it the first one and it was a really very successful piece. And I 
I just did it. I really like it when I send it and pieces come out and you don't know what's, it just, I think it's fascinating. It's like a discovery. It's, it's really fun <laughs> when it's done. After I send it, I treat it again with um, matte medium and that makes the paper a little more translucent. So you discover as you do it and you say, wow, it's, it's it, it just, I enjoy it. <laughs> so I keep on doing it and it is very labor intensive. It's not, I don't like sending, but it's what it is. Is it somewhat meditative? Ascending? No, it's very no, nice. no meditative. Oh, you mean the sending? Is it meditating? Yeah, I mean no. you're in a process. It's just kind of you know falling. If I do it by hand sending. It's different, yes, but yeah. uh, electric sender is very no, okay. <laughs> it's very noisy. It's not fun. Okay, anymore, but, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's worth it because then I have this huge pieces. I usually send two or three together. And I have worked for several months, so it's not it's it's bearable, it's okay. doable. That's uh, it, is all of your work on um, paper? No, I uh, forgot to mention it. I do paste it uh, on um, either some of it. I just adhere to uh, panels, and some I I, I adhere to uh, uh, canvas, and then I I stretch it. I see. But I start with the paper. Yeah. Well, they're all very beautiful. I'm just incredibly blown away by all of it, the figurative and the abstract. Thank Do you, you um, there's a quality about a lot of them that almost looks like encaustic. You know, it looks right. Wacky. It's because the paper, when you send it, just a very thin layer stays. So, and then some of it, I either kind of uh, rub and take it away all the way, some of it tear apart. But the, it's not always all of it adhered together. And um, so it does look like encaustic. Yeah. Th that's really why I keep on doing it because it is just the surprises that you get. You get like really kind of muted and very bright, very bright. It just, um, yeah. And there's it's kind of a non-encaustic, really it's the paper. It, there's kind of a creamy quality to them. Exactly, because the paper is is uh, dissolved sort of. It's almost like a pulp of it or some, something like this. Mm. Sometimes I just send the paper by itself and it creates pulp and I, when you send it on it, it has like holes in it. And then I use that part. And um, when you use the uh, matte medium, it makes it even thinner. And it just, it's almost like a rice paper or something. It's really, it's very, um, it's a wonderful medium. I never thought, and it just because I experiment with it, it came out. And sometimes I embedded um, a twine or thick rope in it. And I always use uh, organic material, for, not just, not because of conceptual reason, but because it's, or cheesecloth. When you send it, it's kind of where in a very, very interesting way. And sometimes I could even cut through and take some of it, but it, it looks like it's still embedded in it. So it's just a lot of discovery through this. And I, I really enjoy this part. I always uh, like to experiment and try new things. So it's you. very tactile. So, all right. Well, your, your first premise that you said that the create creating and destroying the, you know, and the, right. the, and it seems you've developed a process that allows for continual interactions. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, I usually get very restless with things, but this kind of stays with me. I've been doing it for more than 10 years and it's still, I still keep on doing it. So, um, and I keep discovering things. And also I, I change my techniques as I go. My technique now is a lot more involved, much, much more oil paint at the end. And um, so I'm definitely, hopefully we'll stay with this for a long time still. Now it um, doesn't seem like, I'm, 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 it doesn't feel like I'm gonna get bored with it for, right. for a while. So. But it, it sounds like you're, um, it would be only sort of a delight if the if the acrylic underneath, which dries differently, exactly, than the oil, if it caused a change in the surface of the 
of the oil, that would be fine. <laughs> Whereas absolutely, else would yeah, be um, aghast. <laughs> absolutely, I don't. I don't paint very well with acrylic. I don't. Um, no, but the oil goes on top of the acrylic. Oil. Yeah. I I just I train with oil, and I just know how to do it, and I relate to it very well, and I Lovely. like the translucent. Uh, some people paint with acrylic, and they get the feel of oil, but I relate to oil better. So. When I just do the oil painting, I really get into it. I get lost with it, and I really enjoy the enjoy that part. That's that's why it's always the last because I really relate to it. That's where I really painting and um, the acrylic is mostly um, as a technique, as as like sanding or that sort of thing. I just um, it, I I don't I don't consider myself a acrylic painter. If I have to do something serious, I always do it with oil. I I, I have better control on the oil. So it's almost literally like you're using the acrylic, just as you're using your meat your your uh, gesso or your medium. Exactly. It's yeah, in that exactly. mode, and mm -hmm. that the oil is which is I think most of us associate with being, you know, longer lasting. And uh, you're bringing that element to the, you know, you're yeah. finishing that. Right. I I definitely can manipulate the paint and predict and um, control all the element that you need to control when you do a painting like value and color and that sort of thing. So. Oh, it's interesting to see some figurative returning to your work. Do you yeah. see yourself maybe exploring that more? I mean, over the last several years, figures have become the thing. And so uh, they just sort of show up when they need to. Um, I mean, I created a piece for uh, Prasimi that Christine Shoemaker uh, curated. I could still do it, definitely. I could still do. I mean, I used to. My my background is illustration, and uh, I did it for uh, commercial art. It was very very tight, and I always felt like uh, very limited when I moved to fine art. That was my biggest um, challenge, because I always felt like I had to create it by the rules and just write by the image that provided and. Um, I kind of like paint within the lines and I really wanted to break it. So um, I, I think I really had to break it with uh, going to abstract. I, I just had to stay within. It was a very, my, I also was thinking like in an advertisement, advertisement kind of a way. And um, the way I paint now is very, I guess, intuitive. It's sort of, it, it creates by itself. And um it's a lot harder. It takes longer time. For me, it's harder. It takes longer, and um, there's a lot of back and forth, but uh, I definitely enjoy it more. Hmm. Nareen, yes. isn't the, um, the nest that you have um, the one? Oh, God. Empty the nest. empty nest. Yeah. One. Empty nest. Again, wasn't that purchased by CSUN? No, CSUN purchased a, a large uh, figurative painting, which I didn't show here, called oh. Family. And they purchased one of Beatrice Cortez, and I actually donated the other one to CSUN. So CSUN oh, is- Oh, I just busy. remembered one with a hand or something from that. With two hands. Yeah, there were, there were several empty nests. I showed just- Oh, there was more than one. I see. Yeah, um, I so love that piece. I, I, I'm, I remember you curated the- that show that it was in um, emptiness was very tough for me. They like um, I didn't expect it to be so hard, and uh, I don't look fondly on those pieces. I kind of say I'm glad you're, those you're a gifted um, representational painter, and um, I and not that you're not a gifted abstract painter, but just because I have experience seeing your. Right those other pieces and the way you've transitioned. I mean, all the shows I've seen that you've done, I just, they're very moving and your sense of color and it's just chef's kiss. Thank you. <laughs> I think when you do a figurative, 
in a way, once you master the technique, it's it's a little easier because the viewer or you relate. Basically, you know when you're done, when it looks like the what you want it to, to look like. You always have to have a reference. I mean, not always, but and also the the viewer relates to the figure. So the other elements, composition and color balance, and are not that important because it's um People really, when you have a figure with other elements, you go to the figure. So I think abstract is, to me, is a little more interesting because you create the feeling, the whole canvas talk to you, and you really have to master your other, um, you have to use your knowledge for other things. So it is just more interesting. It almost feel like I'm uh, apologizing for doing abstract. A lot of people, my collectors were very upset when I moved from figurative to abstract <laughs> so um it's your background as an illustrator it's a, you know um karen i'm thinking of jean edelstein remember that she did these really large uh paintings and she came from a background of illustration but towards the end a lot of her painting was abstract but she loved to paint when there were dancers in her studio yeah, and there's an aspect of being lyrical in your work, even though the figure isn't there for me. It's very, it's, really... uh, uh, thank you. Um, you're not the first one to tell me that, that they could see that I have a background in figurative. So because of the abstract, they can tell. And um, it's interesting. I cannot tell, but... Um, it's just part of your... Tell. It's it's part. It's in your vocabulary. That's all. I guess so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still enjoy taking life drawing and I do doodling with the figure and I, I really love the figure. But I think it's it's just a different mindset. It's sort of, I would say it's not challenging enough. I, I've uh -huh. got to the point where I could, quote unquote, knock down a, pa a large painting with several figures within two, three weeks. And I it felt like commercial art again. It felt like I'm under the clock. I mean, commercial art, we did a lot of work and it's always under the clock and it did not have uh, the fun of it. I mean, commercial art, the fun was getting paid. <laughs> not so much with fine art. So, And I don't know that when I came back to it after raising my family and everything, I wanted to go back to this lifestyle. Of Mary, one of the things... Um in teaching abstract art, which is always challenging, but many of the artists talk about how their feelings are so immense that communicating them through abstraction, through color, through paint, through movement is much more satisfying for them. They feel that they can you know, uh, relay those feelings so much more than they can in representational forms. So you take an artist like Mother Well, or I'm not saying Pollock said this, but, um, you know, that kind of sensibility that, and, and that's the way that I always tried to help them explain it, that there's just more feeling um, in it for the artist and hopefully for the viewer as well. So very true. Um, the way I work, I don't make like a little sketch. A lot of people do, and I maybe one day I will do it too. It's definitely more practical to take like a little sketch and follow it. Um, you saw my large pieces when they hang. I just look at them, and all of a sudden my eyes start tracking a path, and all of a sudden I don't know. All of a sudden I just know what it's going to be about, and I know the feeling, and. Um, when at that stage, it's probably the best because once I start working with it, there's a lot of frustration. And sometimes I I think it's a miracle that paintings actually happen because, I mean, some like this one painting, Icarus, took me nine months. So I, I and sometimes my pieces even hang in a show and I come and I change them <laughs> so, <laughs> with uh, uh, pastels. I'm not oil, but just oil pastel. And um, it's just, sometimes I'm just saying, I, I don't even know how those pieces come about, but it is very satisfying when you have a vision and you, it's, you may not follow it all the way, but 
when you look at it and it's sort of like uh, you have a conversation with it, which I did not have with the figurative art at all. Figurative art was more like, is it checking? Is it is it compared to the photo? Is it compared to the model? Is it is the hand okay? Is And it was just, um, I, I really was getting very restless with it. I couldn't do it. And I really wanted to break the, the um, to break the outline. That's why I incorporated the printmaking with it. Technically, it was part of it. I, I'm not sure exactly how it came about, but it seems the right way for me at the time. That the, the printmaking was something that I could easily incorporate the figure was because I, it was almost like a collage. I could place it, see if it works, doesn't work, and that sort of thing. So I definitely don't think I will go to figure it even unless it's a commission or I've asked to do it. I, I after one or two pieces, I get very restless with it. Still, by the way, you're in good company because I understand that the artist Turner, the British artist, used to go in at the you know when they were showing the work, and you know they have like the preview, and he would look around, and then he would go in there with his paint and, <laughs> and do some other stuff. So you're not alone. I'm sure there are a lot of artists like this That's because when you, hang it, when you hang your piece, all of a sudden you see what sure. you do in the studio. You'll get a fresh look. And uh, sometimes it's not the kind of fresh you want to look at. Right. Well, and, and when other people are, you see, you're experiencing other people seeing it, then even without words being spoken. Exactly. It, it's in a new stage. But there was one of your pieces, because I, I, I have this concept that a lot of times you know if you look at traditional you know if you're at the getty and looking the old you know the at 15th century art or something like this and you squint or el greco right. you see you see how it became abstract and there was one of your paintings and it reminded me it was as if i had squinted at a ruth weisberg painting oh it was very biblical in some way and I just you know which that, one? Which one is it? I we could go back and I could find it. I I couldn't. Okay. You know, but it it had it. The, her, there was as if there were fig from in my way of saying as if there was a screen with some figures behind it, and mm. and it was a little more narrative than than some. But yes. I it just instantly I was thinking of her work, which it's be interesting that the two of you have a conversation because I think she works with the figure for similar reasons. Mm -hmm. I saw her work. She did a presentation in Simon, what do you call it? The museum in Pasadena. Not, yeah, yeah. Modern Simon. And those pieces in in person are stunning. She yeah. had like That's a figure. A huge, she has a huge exhibition now at Jack Rutberg. And oh, Pasadena. thank you for telling me. I will definitely yeah, go. Yeah, it just this. got extended. It was supposed to end now. Oh, it got extended, right. so I'm not sure how much longer it'll be there. Thank you for sharing, because yeah. I will definitely make a point well, of seeing it. I haven't been to his new place. And, um, oh, she's she's incredible figure in painting. Yeah. You she could go on, on um, go on Jack Rutberg, um, the, the website. Website, yeah. And thank you for saying it. it. Yeah, and definitely. And speaking of Ruth, I have actually seen her take um an oil pastel <laughs> out in a collector's home and do something <laughs> yeah um, um, i haven't done it in a home but i will maybe <laughs> yeah well i i there's just something i remember her speaking you know when there was the in 2007, when there was whack and the whole Judy Chicago, the dinner party and the caucus had that big show, <laughs> multiple vantage points of it. Uh, Ruth had a show at the Skirball and right. it had her figurative work. And everyone was, she actually had to coach the docents for them to, to realize that she was taking a strong feminist standpoint mm. with but having chosen the biblical figures and, and most of her models are her family. Yeah. Uh, that's was, what I heard. That's right. That's what her, I heard. Right. Her daughter and all, but, but it was this aspect that it wasn't, people were assuming that, that, you know, kind of the content 
was being, you know, it had to be a certain style of art or something for it to have a certain really depth or resonance or making like your statements around migration and all. And Pam just went off, but it made me think of her work. I mean, there's just a lot of your work. I think it really, this may sound strange, but my experience of it is that it sort of plays well with others. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think you touch I, on a lot of things. Yeah. I never thought she was, uh, she wasn't feminist. I always kind of assumed it. I don't even know. Right. Why. Well, yeah. She's that's strong in, women. In, her, her, in women her presence. Yeah. 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 And not necessarily stylized in a, uh, you know, sort of like a idealized, the, the real people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it's come from, the, the, the real person, the real story behind them. But um, yeah, I would uh, I would love to to have further conversation with her. It will be very interesting, <laughs> definitely. So, Pam, what did you think in seeing her work and seeing today's uh, today's work? with your narratives that you've built up. Are you talking to me? I was talking to Pam. If oh. I, she heard you're, oh. you're, on, you're, you're muted. Oh. If you do want to talk. Oh, no, no. Okay. I, <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate you sharing all this beautiful work, Nora. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see, there's one, something in the chat. Um, yeah, I just put um, Jack Rutberg. Um, oh, great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. No, I'm sure, I'm sure I can, um, I'm sure I'll find him. I, yeah. I, yeah, I love his gallery and he's very, is the painting, they're very luscious. Right. They're I haven't been, been, but I believe it's on Lake Street. Is that right, Nancy? Yeah, it's kind of tricky to find. Um, it's like we were parked right there and didn't know exactly where it was. It's, oh. it's sort of in a, like um, a little, I don't know, there are other stores and uh, buildings in there. You have to go around the back in the parking lot. And, is, is it on the east side or the west side of the street? Oh, uh, you know what? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when so I there's some the that go out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, thank you for warning me. I will definitely find it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't find it, absolutely. Thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank it you was. for joining. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I enjoyed it.